Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All manner of persons having anything to bring before the Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Delaware will now draw near and give their attendance. The court is now open. God save the state and the Honorable Court. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Good morning. I know it's typically the Chief Justice's role to welcome Capitol Police, but uh, I do it myself here, and he'll probably do it again. Are there any introductions to be made? Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Ms. Farnan. Good morning. May it please the court, Kelly Farnan from Richards, Layton and Finger on behalf of Wilmington Friends School. I'd like to introduce to the court Ken Aldridge, who is the head of school, David Tennant, who is the chair of the Board of Trustees, Bill Bukowski, associate head of school for finance and operations, and Jennifer Brady, vice chair of the Board of Trustees. Welcome. Mr. Aronson. Good morning, Your Honor, and may it please the court. A couple of brief introductions myself, my colleague Holly Newell, Jim Green, and I want to briefly acknowledge a number of the AMC directors who have made the trip as well. Again, may it please the court, and good morning. The decision below deprived the, the AMC of the opportunity to show on a factual record at trial that relied upon deed criteria could be applied objectively in this situation that the AMC board had acted reasonably in denying the school's proposal on those grounds. And while those fact questions are ultimately for another day, we believe that reversal here is warranted on two independent legal bases. First, the court below wrongfully limited the enforceability of harmony criteria to communities with distinctive architectural styles. And second, the court committed numerous procedural errors in wrongfully placing the burden on the AMC at the pleading stage. These errors resulted in, among other things, a fact finding on the pleadings that the board acted arbitrarily in denying the school's proposal, notwithstanding the, the lack of any supporting allegation or consideration of the board's denial letter. By way of brief factual background, Wilmington Friends School is the lone non-residential property in Alapocas, and its upper school campus sits in the middle of the neighborhood. In late 2019, the school agreed to sell its separate lower school campus to Insight. That sale is not impacted by this litigation or appeal as the lower campus sits outside Alapocas and is not covered by the deed restrictions. But the school's proposed construction of an entirely new elementary school on the upper school campus is covered and the board's ultimate denial of the school's request for approval under the deed restrictions is what brings us here today. That denial decision, and importantly, the board's reasons for it, was conveyed to the school in the January letter in the record at A35. Among other things, the board explained that the proposal would, quote, introduce out-of-scale buildings and upend the neighborhood's space building ratio. The board also explained that the proposal would negatively impact the views of neighboring and adjacent homes. In short, the board explained that while it had never previously denied an expansion request of the schools, the proposal here was entirely different given the impact that it would have on Alipocus. In the school's February response letter, it argued principally that only paragraph three of the deed restrictions applied to it. Further back, followed, further back and forth, excuse me, followed, and the school initiated this lawsuit. Like its February letter, the school's complaint focused on the alleged inapplicability of paragraph five to the school. And while the school also alleged, without specific facts or elaboration, that the board's denial was, quote, not based on objective criteria, it did not allege that the board's denial decision was arbitrary, that it was pretextual, or anything of that sort. What are the objective criteria? Well, the objective criteria here is size and density. And, and I could go into, and I will get into, Your Honor, um, okay. how the board applied that objectively. But where does that appear? Why, where does size and density appear? in the actual restrictions? It does not. Just like in Christine Manor, size did not um, appear in the, in the deed restrictions at issue there, yet Vice Chancellor Noble in that case noted that harmony meant that the, that the deed restrictions were not that narrow. The question, of course, as we'll get to, is whether or not the criteria can be applied objectively, and the cases are legion in terms of, while well, a number of them, um, including the Lawhon case that the school relies on, has that fixed language, objective criteria, precise um, language, when you look at what the courts actually hold, it's that unlike pure aesthetics, which is, which is um, found in uh, numerous deed restrictions, unlike pure aesthetics, harmony does not fail as, as per se unenforceably vague. And I think the BBD case 
makes that clear. It literally goes through the four different criteria that could have been applied there and knocks out three of them as failing for objectivity. Uh, the one that it didn't was Harmony. So the school moves for partial summary judgment, excuse me, partial judgment on the pleading solely on the applicability of paragraph five. We cross moved as to both that gating issue and more broadly given the, the legal nature in which the, the, the school challenged the board's denial in its complaint. The lion's share of the briefing focused on that paragraph five applicability issue. The argument and decision, however, centered on the reach of harmony and, and questions like your honors. In particular, the court below in its decision assumed paragraph five's applicability, but limited the enforceability of harmony to communities with distinctive architectural styles akin to the Key West one at issue in Dolan. Well, didn't, in fairness to the Court of Chancery, didn't it ultimately tie the, the uh, coherent visual style to the uh, ability to apply the restriction even-handedly? Um, and isn't that what you're, isn't that what we need to be focused on? The court, absolutely we need to be focused on that. I don't think that the court's ruling was that narrow. If you look at page, if you look at all of the analysis of the court, it was essentially dealing with Dolan, the distinct architectural situation, and how this situation differed and was distinguishable. That's clear from page six of the opinion, where the court talks about Dolan being cabined by its facts. It's clear from page seven of the opinion, where the court says that, said that the Dolan and rationale didn't apply there. And it's certainly clear from footnote 30 of the opinion, in which the court went so far as to suggest that harmony can only be upheld in a Dolan-like situation. As we'll get to, and it's in the briefing, there are two situations in which the coherent visual style requirement is met, both the Dolan scenario and also the um, incongruous, objectively incongruous category. Uh, but, but how the board applied that standard that you're, you're focusing on, Justice Trainer, is by definition factual as well. And again, the question for today, and we'll get into this, isn't whether or not we should have won outright, putting aside our, our limited cross motion. The question is whether we should have been deprived of the opportunity to make those showings on a factual record at trial. It seems to me that the parties um, teed this up for a, a decision on the papers. And parties do that, assuming they're, they're going to prevail. And then uh, frequently, uh, when they don't prevail, they said, oh, we shouldn't have done this on, on the papers. Well, why, why shouldn't I view uh, the board's position in that light? It's a great question. Uh, obviously, the existence of cross motions, each side of the cross motion has to be viewed under the desert equities um, standard, which I'm going to get to momentarily. You have to look at the discrete nature of the reason that the board moved. The board didn't move on the basis that it acted reasonably. The board moved on a kind of like in a summary judgment setting, a failure of proof, if you will. The lone basis for the school's allegation that the board acted unreasonably in denying the proposal was that paragraph 20, excuse me, that the deed criteria itself, paragraph five, purportedly failed for lack of objective criteria. That is a quintessential legal issue. That is the reason we moved. But regardless of whether we were entitled to judgment as a matter of law on that, and I think we could have prevailed, mm -hmm. uh, the school still had the burden of proving that viewing all allegations in, in our favor, that it was entitled to judgment of the law, judgment as a matter of law. And so I think you have to look at both sides of the cross motions. Ours was inherently legal and limited, or else we wouldn't have moved given the factual nature of, of the reasonable inquiries that animate these deed restriction cases. Um, but, but certainly having moved ourselves doesn't concede that uh, judgment on the pleadings necessarily could be granted in favor of the school. You have to look at both sides. And so why don't I jump into the standard of review and that desert equities um, standard. The parties agree here, of course, that the no, de novo review applies. And desert equities confirms that judgment on the pleadings may only be granted when, quote, viewing all well-pled facts and reasonable inferences in the non-moving party's favor, the movement is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. Let me start with the procedural errors at play here. Rather than cite desert equities or any other pleading standard authority, the court stated at page three of its opinion that, quote, the burden is on the HOA to show that the actions enforcing the restrictions are non-arbitrary and reasonable as applied. While the AMC would clearly bear that burden at trial, again, on the pleadings, all fact inferences were, were required to be drawn in our favor before granting the school judgment on the pleadings. The court nevertheless went further 
and made fact-based findings in the school's favor, including as to the board's purported motives in, in denying the proposal and being motivated by, quote, nothing more than its aesthetic sensibilities and a desire to maintain open space as an amenity of Alapocas. State of mind questions, however, are classic fact issues and not only was the board deprived of the opportunity to present evidence amplifying uh, the points that it made in its denial letter, again, the denial letter was never referenced by the court in its short letter opinion. At a minimum, accepting the truth of the board's stated reasons as required under Desert Equities should have been done and was required before granting the school judgment as a matter of law. But Mr. Aaron Sam, didn't the, what the trial court seemed to be saying was not that the board acted in an arbitrary or capricious manner, but that the harmony criteria as it relates to the open space requirement that you seem to be relying on in front of the trial court could never be applied in a, in a reasonable or non-arbitrary manner as a matter of law. Do you disagree that that was the court's holding? Uh, I think that's a fair summary of the court's holding with, with, with a couple of caveats. I think that um, open space, those questions that were going back and forth in the argument below, of course, were viewed through the, the court's focus on just the first issue, uh, the first um, situation in which um, uh, harmony can be can be dealt with, that the Dolan situation. But of course, um, the, the mere fact that there's one um, that there's one school or there's a, a different kind of property does not mean that the school could do anything without it being objecti objectively incongruous. That's the whole reason that the cases have the two buckets in which uh, the coherent visual style requirement could be met. How, and, and this is returning to something I answered in, in, in response to Justice Trainer's question, how the court applied the harmony standard here, whether it was objective, is inherently factual. And when you juxtapose this case with the legion of, of other cases cited by both parties, they almost universally, outside the limited type of legal issue that I was talking about earlier that motivated our cross motion, they almost universally are decided on a developed factual record post pleading, be that summary judgment or trial. Our simple point with this appeal is we should be given the chance. We should have been given the chance to make these showings um, on a factual record and we were deprived of the ability to do so. Mr. Aronson, uh, your time is running short. I want to uh, run one thing by you. Uh, at pages seven and eight of the trial court's opinion, the, uh, the vice chancellor wrote, there is only one school in Alapocas. The lots in Alapocas are not restricted as to percentage of open space by the deed covenants, and no other Alapocas property is subject to use restriction simply because such use would decrease open space. And my question is a simple one. Is that an accurate statement? Uh, it factually, uh, it's accurate based on what's in the pleadings, but that goes to our point. That's something that we would have done. We made this point in our, in our brief. That point uh, is something we would have disputed had it been alleged by the school. The reality is that residential properties have had projects denied for, um, for on, on harmony grounds. It is not limited to the school. It is not the only instance. On open we did space grounds? Uh, our, our argument has never been limited to open space. That has been the main point, but even as the, as the Vice Chancellor noticed in two instances in his decision, open space directly relates to, um, to density, but our focus has been on the density and the outsized scale of this community and this proposal relative to the community. That is very clear from our denial letter at A37 where we talk about the neighborhood space building ratio and the impact it would have. That's clear from our briefing below and our central alliance on Christine Manor. The school recognized that we were concerned about size concerns in the record at A255. And we also tethered our open space for, um, concerns to the vastness of the proposal at argument at A394. It's never been that narrow. It's a factual question what the board was relying on. Mr. Uh, Ernstan? Yes, Your Honor. Um, does the history of the of submitting modifications under paragraph three and not paragraph five, is that something that matters? Well, the short answer is no. Um, as we noted in our brief, the mere fact, everyone concedes that paragraph three applies to the school. That's not in dispute. Paragraph five, of course, is the issue. The mere fact that the board complied with paragraph three in recording the board's ultimate approval of those prior projects does not speak to the, the manner or the process by which the board arrived at its prior approval conclusions. And so we don't think that that, that ultimately matters. Um, I want to talk about one more procedural issue before, before turning to the, to the, um, 
to the application of harmony and it not being as limited as, as set forth in the court below. The school attacks the AMC for purportedly failing to identify disputed issues of fact. But as we explained at page 15 of our reply, there were numerous fact findings made by the court that would have been disputed had they been alleged. Clearly, Desert Equities does not contemplate parties being prejudiced for failing to allege, uh, for failing to deny allegations not made in the pleadings. I do want to circle back to the point we touched upon in terms of the school's response to all of these procedural er issues is whether, uh, is, is that somehow in moving for, for judgment on the pleadings, we, we conceded that uh, judgment could necessarily be granted in, in their favor. Uh, again, we moved given the discrete legal nature. Um, at most, the school in paragraph 21 of its complaint alleges that the board acted unreasonably in denying the proposal because paragraph five itself purportedly failed for, for lack of objective criteria. Um, that's a legal issue. Regardless of whether we could have prevailed on that issue, the school still needed to be held to its burden, including the stated reasons in the January denial letter being viewed in our favor, not the other way around. These procedural errors alone, we would submit uh, warrant reversal, and the court needn't go further. But I do want to touch on those those um, standard questions that, that that your honors had in a little bit more detail, uh, because we do believe that the court erred in limiting the harmony inquiry to the to the the Dolan situation uh, with distinctive um, architectural styles. Again, harmony is also upheld where a structure is just objectively incongruous. With, with the neighborhood and surroundings in a manner that can be objectively applied. That's the BBD case. Christine Manor puts it differently, uh, but relatedly upholds harmony where a proposal is out of keeping with the neighborhood. Rather than directly respond to either of these um, key points, the school embraces the language in case law upholding harmony where a neighborhood possesses a, quote, sufficiently coherent visual style, and there's a reasoned, non-arbitrary basis to assess whether the proposal would disrupt the visual harmony of the affected community. To be very clear, we cited that very language at page 17 of our opening brief, but the school's wooden focus on that language elides the two situations in which the coherent visual style requirement is met, including the second objectively incongruous category we rely on. I really want to point on this, uh, pause on this, because it really cuts to the core of the disconnect, I believe, at play. Coherent visual style in our case law is not synonymous with distinct architectural style. Again, architectural style is one way in which the coherent visual style may be met. Yes, is sir. Is the school in and of itself objectively incongruous with the rest of the uh, development uh, to begin with? Yeah, it's, it's a great question and the short answer is yes and then you go to the deed restriction which requires a comparison between the proposal so the school as it is and its surroundings and so yes of course from the beginning in the 30s this land was set aside for a school but in, but in assessing whether or not the board was reasonable in assessing uh, the proposal at issue here you have to you have to by definition compare the proposal to the school, which admittedly is different and bigger. Uh, and that actually redounds, and that, that's the point that I promised to come back to in terms of the broader impact on the neighborhood from a density perspective. The first paragraph of the, of the, of the analysis, the, the conclusion, conclusion section in the denial letter, references the neighborhood's building space ratio. The school's proposal would increase the developed areas of the property, the, the campus, by 66%. That in and of itself is an objective factor, a verifiable fact that can be assessed and developed further at trial. But the greater impact on their neighborhood, given the, the, the size, the 21 acre size of that lower school campus, is disproportionately large and impactful in a negative way on the, uh, on the neighborhood. That's a quantitative analysis. If you look at this from a qualitative perspective, the, campus, the school proposes going from a campus with one upper school to a campus with two schools by adding an entirely new school. So whether you're looking at looking at it from a qualitative or a quantitative perspective, there is a, you know, the, the factual question that we were deprived of the ability to show. And again, this isn't for today, but we would we would ask and submit we would be entitled to a remand to try to make on a factual record a showing that this proposal here, given those facts and the other ones we would develop, was objectively incongruous. I know you're into your rebuttal time, and that's the time is yours. So I appreciate it. Well. I'm just going to make a point on paragraph five, and then I will 
reserve the rest of my rebuttal time, Your Honor. Um, so the school renews its paragraph five argument. Uh, the key plain text of paragraph five, which the school does not address in its answering brief, um, provides, quote, no building or other structure shall be uh, erected or maintained unless approved by the AMC. That no building language is unqualified and unambiguous in terms of applying to all proposed buildings and structures on the campus, not just residential ones. This is particularly important because the drafters knew how to limit paragraphs to residences when they wanted to, or to exclude the friend school track when intended. And paragraphs seven, eight, and nine make that plain. Um, I answered your honor's questions earlier about the, um, the prior AMC approvals. They're just factually distinguishable. Um, both as to the approved language as well and the vastly differing scopes. At bottom, the plain language of paragraph five applies, viewing the paragraphs and the deed restrictions as a whole and giving meaning to all the paragraphs. We think they unambigu unambiguously confirm paragraph five's apl applicability to the school. And absent any further questions, I will yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Mr. Aronson. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. Good morning again. Good morning. May it please the court. Uh, Kelly Farnan again on behalf of Wilmington Friends School. We'd ask that this court affirm the judgment of the Court of Chancery, and it can do so on two independent grounds. First, the Court of Chancery correctly held as a matter of law that an attempt to impose an open space requirement under the guise of a harmony deed, re deed restriction is unenforceable as a matter of Delaware law. And in the alternative, as we raised in our papers below, we think this court can also affirm on the grounds that it is paragraph three, the only paragraph that mentions schools in the deed restrictions that should have been applied. And AMC has no basis to deny the school's plans under that paragraph. But of course, I wanna start with and spend most of my time on the Court of Chancery's well-reasoned decision. Fundamentally, AMC is trying to take a deed restriction that allows it to consider harmony with the surroundings and transform it into a requirement that Wilmington Friends School maintain some unspecified amount of open space on its property for the benefit of the neighborhood. This property was specifically identified and set aside in the deed restrictions for the school and is labeled as the Friends School Track. There's no support in Delaware law or in the deed restrictions for that position. And I wanna start with a few fundamental points of Delaware law that I really don't think are controversial but which guide the outcome here. First, Delaware has consistently respected property rights and indicated that deed restrictions are disfavored and therefore construed narrowly. And deed restrictions likewise are only enforceable if they articulate a clear, precise, and fixed standard the reviewing body must apply. Harmony restrictions like the one at issue here receive, are viewed with additional skepticism due to the high likelihood that they would inject some measure of subjectivity or aesthetics. And the case law indicates that they've been found enforceable when a community possesses a sufficiently coherent visual style, enabling fair and even-handed application. And I think the key overarching thread that you see throughout Delaware law is a concern for objectivity and an ability for someone who is subject to deed restrictions to understand what is being imposed on them and what they need to do to comply. Do you agree and, that the critical inquiry when considering the enforceability of a visual harmony restriction is whether the, the proposal under consideration is objectively incongruous with its surroundings. I would agree, Your Honor, that objectivity is the key of this is the key standard. Uh, I think the uh, the incongruous language really doesn't change that. The obviously incongruous language is what AMC relies on. It comes from the BBD Beach case. I think if Your Honor looks at the BBD Beach case, that statement doesn't come. That that case has a legal standard section which sets forth all of the principles that we've talked about here today and the ones that the court, the court of Chancery relied on in pages three to four of its opinion. And then in giving an example of a prior case where a deed restriction was upheld, it indicates that it was so obviously incongruous, but then it clarifies that it can be objectively assessed and applied. So again, coming back to the key aspect of objectivity. And that's what's completely lacking in this case. And I think um, AMC really fails that objectivity test by a wide margin. And the Court of Chancery illustrated it well on page 10 of its letter opinion. In concluding its opinion, the Court of Chancery asked, quote, 
What portion of its land may the school develop consistent with AMC's understanding of harmony? No one can say. Where can the school locate additional buildings? There is no way to tell other than to rely on an arbitrary decision from AMC. And to this day, AMC cannot and has not answered these questions. And instead, they argue to this court on page 10 of their reply brief that Delaware law does not require that level of specificity and that the failure to answer those questions is legally irrelevant. That position, in our view, effectively concedes the lack of objectivity. What AMC is saying there is that it's acceptable to enforce a deed restriction against Wilmington Friends School that has no standards and where Friends has no concept of how it can apply with the restriction that's being imposed on it. And we've heard that, we heard open space was really the focus of the Court of Chancery. Today we heard size and density. None of those things appear expressly in the deed restrictions. They are all trying to bring them in through this harmony deed restriction. But the attempt to do that is unenforceable, again, as a matter of law. And I think we need to look, as the Court of Chancery did, at the circumstances of this case, as well as the deed restrictions. As has been discussed a little bit already with your honors, this is a, a, a tract of land that has been specifically reserved for Wilmington Friends School. On it already exists several school buildings, a middle school and an upper school, as well as a gymnasium and plenty of athletic fields. And there's no dispute that if this construction goes forward, there will be an additional school building, but there will still be school buildings and athletic fields. And there's no basis in that AMC has identified in the deed restrictions to try to limit the amount of school that's put on this property. So if and the school uh, proposed to eliminate all open space, would, would the board be powerless to, under, as the restrictions are uh, crafted, to uh, oppose that? Thus far, the AMC hasn't identified anything in the deed restrictions that would prohibit that. The interesting thing, I think, about harmony restrictions, like, as the Court of Chancery said, and as we say, we're not saying that the harmony restriction that appears in the deed restriction is invalid for all purposes. There could be some other objective criteria that's identified for some other purpose, perhaps for the residences, that might be enforceable. But here, there is nothing in the deed restrictions that, uh, that mentions open space, and to try to bring that in through the harmony restriction is legally improper. I will also, uh, Your Honor, point out that the deed restrictions here already address setbacks in paragraph six, and as to the residences, they address side yard requirements in paragraph seven. And so in, in light of those restrictions, to take a harmony restriction and say, that imposes some open space requirement that limits what friends can do with his land, that's where it becomes legally improper. Ms. Farnan, how, how do you counter AMC's interpretation of paragraph five? <clears throat> and and that, well, in the alternative, mm -hmm. that, that's all alternative argument, Your Honor, that paragraph three applies. And I think if you look at the deed restrictions, it is fairly clear if you begin with paragraph 11 of the deed restrictions, and well, I'll start, to, I'll start and directly answer your question. They get to paragraph five applying by a, a textual argument as between paragraph three and paragraph five. Paragraph three states that buildings used for schools may be erected and maintained in locations approved by Woodlawn trustees, provided the design of such building be approved by Woodlawn trustees, and then further providing that that declaration be filed with the recorder of deeds. What the AMC says, is that word design somehow pulls in all of the requirements of paragraph five. But paragraph three doesn't reference paragraph five, and paragraph five does not contain the word design. And I think to your honor's earlier question, while it's not necessary, it certainly is instructive to look at the three prior times that the AMC has approved expansions of the Friends School campus. Those declarations are in the record at A173 to A193. And each of those mentions they reference erection, maintenance, use, and design. All of the key words that appear in paragraph three, nothing from paragraph five. And so without that uh, contextual overlap, there's really no basis to pull the paragraph five restrictions into paragraph three. And I will just address the alternative argument while I'm on it, just to point out, to flesh out the remainder of our argument on that point. Paragraph 11 is very clear. It says, if and when the land known as Friends School Tract shall no longer be used for school purposes and shall be used for residential purposes, said land shall be subject to all limitations, reservations, restrictions, and conditions herein contained. 
That's a clear intent to treat the Friends School track differently and to subject it to fewer restrictions than the remainder of the neighborhood. And given Delaware Law's uh, consistent admonition to read deed restrictions narrowly, I think that paragraph 11 shows the clear intent of the restrictions and why paragraph three, the only one that applies to schools, should apply to Wilmington Friends School. And I think we've heard numerous concessions, in fact, by, from AMC that there's nothing about the design of the buildings that's of concern. And so the paragraph three design requirement has clearly been met here. And under paragraph three, the school should be able to move forward. I want to, I want to return to the first argument. Ms. Farnan, if you're going back to the first argument, can I just ask you, the, the principal argument to this court that AMC seems to be making is that the, the Court of Chancery's ruling was premature, that the Court of Chancery should have engaged in a fact-finding exercise. Can you identify any case in which either the Court of Chancery or this court has, uh, as a matter of law, deemed a deed restriction unconstitutional, or uh, not unconstitutional, sorry, outside of the unconstitutional racial issues, determined as a matter of law that a deed restriction could not be enforced in the way that the, the board sought to enforce it, as opposed to a yes. fact-finding exercise later on. Yes, Your Honor. I think the wild quail case illustrates that the best. Um, in the wild quail case, it had to do with um, the color of a roof, and there was a color restriction that said you could have a roof of soft tones, and then there was a harmony restriction. And uh, what the court said, actually, there, it's a, there is a summary judgment decision and then a trial decision. At the summary judgment level, what the court said, and that's what we're advocating here, it said, okay, you have the color restriction for soft tones, and then if it's not a soft tone, you have this backup of the visual harmony requirement and harmony with the neighborhood. That, the court held that that structure, although confusing, was sufficiently objective to be enforceable as a matter of law at summary judgment. Then at the trial level, it went on to figure out whether or not that had been applied objectively. And I think that's what the Court of Chancery did here. It said, first, you, and, and I think harmony restrictions are a little bit unique in this regard because you're asking what is the harmony that you're enforcing? And that's the level at which the court said, there's no basis in Delaware law to impose open space in a harmony restriction. Now, if the court had found that that was appropriate under Delaware law, then it would have moved on to say, did the AMC do this arbitrarily or otherwise? Effectively, what the court said is there is no way to not do this arbitrarily. If you don't have objective standards, you don't have an enforceable deed restriction. So I think what the Court of Chancery did was appropriate I think you can see that in the wild quail case. I think you can also see it um, in uh, Chancellor Strine's affirmance in the Dolan case of, of, of that two-part analysis where first you look to see are there objective standards that can be enforced and then you look to see if it was arbitrarily applied. But I think here on, on the procedural issue, again, what you're looking at is a deed restriction and interpreting as a matter of law. That is not uh, a controversial way to proceed and I think here, the Court of Chancery noted that there were no facts in dispute, and AMC has not identified any factual issues that were resolved. I heard today Mr. Aronstrom say there were factual issues, and I was waiting to hear what they were, and I didn't hear any. Um, and importantly, again, because it's interpretation of deed restrictions, I think that is appropriate to do as a matter of law. But I also want to point out that what AMC is positing before this court is really a reversal of what they said to the Court of Chancery. And we highlighted uh, at pages 22 to 23 of our answering brief some of the inconsistencies in the AMC's procedural challenge here. But at bottom, AMC chose to file a cross motion for judgment on the pleadings. And they argued that the issues were solely legal issues. It never told the Court of Chancery that there were factual issues that needed to be resolved. And in fact, at every turn, said the exact opposite. So having chosen the procedure, and having represented multiple times, and again, we put these in our brief, that these were purely legal issues, this court should not engage in AMC's new procedural challenge. Uh, I do want to go back and address um, AMC's assertion that somehow the Court of Chancery misapplied the law and that there's a second standard that somehow the Court of Chancery missed. And I addressed this briefly before when I was talking about the BBD Beach case. But again, the legal standard section in that case is entirely consistent with the legal standard that the court applied here. And it also, again, made clear when it was talking about obviously incongruous 
that it had to be objectively assessed and applied. So the requirement of objectivity remains in the BBD Beach case. The BBD Beach case was not creating new law, and there's nothing that the Court of Chancery missed. So AMC then turns to leaning heavily on the Christine Manor case to suggest, again, that open space can somehow meet the legal requirement for harmony restrictions. But AMC stretches that case well beyond its facts to try to get there. Is, In it, that is case, it critical to get to your result that we limit the, our inquiry in, to the open space issue? Uh, your friends are trying to uh, have us look more broadly to other considerations. Uh, I don't think it's critical, Your Honor. Uh, open space was very clear, and if you even look at their, their letter, which is at A37 on page 3, they talk about existing open green space. They said it several times to the Court of Chancery at argument. It became clear that's what they were relying on. Today, I've also heard size and density. I don't think it's material whether you're looking at size, density, and the Court of Chancery mentioned density in its opinion, or open space. The fact remains that AMC has not identified any objective standard that it was applying. There is no objective standard that's been identified. And I, I heard today that you can talk about building space ratio. Well, that is a number, but there, there's no indication as to what standard Friends needs to comply with and how they would comply. When you don't have a standard, there, Delaware law is clear that you cannot enforce a deed restriction in that manner against Wilmington Friends. Ms. Farnan, <clears throat> is it your position that open space is a separate criteria from Harmony? Well, I think the way that the AMC has presented it is that the only way they can get to open space is through the Harmony restriction. I think it's a, a concession on their part that there's no open space requirement in the deed restrictions. And so the only way that they find to try to pull that in is through the Harmony restriction. I hope that answers Your Honor's question. Um, I do want to turn back a little bit to the Christine Manor case because I do think it's being stretched well beyond its facts. In that case, the deed restrictions limited each lot to a residence and one private garage. And the garage there was rejected for several reasons, for being too big, too barn-like, and too commercial or agricultural in appearance for a residential area, and aesthetically inconsistent with the rest of the neighborhood. But as the Court of Chancery co correctly noted in footnote 23 of its opinion, those findings were made objective by reference to other structures. So again, you have a neighborhood where everyone's allowed to have one private garage, and you're able to look and determine that what was being built was in fact not a private garage, but an industrial structure. And AMC focus, focuses heavily on the quote, deviates so much language from that opinion. But what the court said is it deviates so much from any other outbuildings. Again, bringing in that required objectivity. I think importantly, there's no mention of open space in Christine Manor. Open space was not a basis for the decision, and it doesn't support the novel open space theory here. And so at bottom, I think the Court of Chancery did correctly hold as a matter of law, as has been consistent throughout Delaware law, that when you don't have objective criteria that are sought to be applied in a deed restriction, those deed restrictions are unenforceable as a matter of law. And I do want to raise one issue uh, that was addressed in the briefing but wasn't really raised today. AMC raised an argument in their papers that the court had ignored their outlook argument. And again, as we said in pages 28 and 29 of our brief, that was not something that was heavily focused on, on in the Court of Chancery. But I think it's um, illustrative of how the open space requirement cannot be enforceable. The Court of Chancery held in Seabrake, which was a, an opinion that was affirmed by this court, it also appears in the BBD Beach case that Outlook has no built-in objective standard and is unenforceable. Delaware law has held that as a matter of law over and over again. And I think when you consider the open space requirement that AMC, whether it's open space, whether it's density, whether it's size, when you look at what they are seeking to impose on Wilmington Friends School here, it's very much like the Outlook standard that has been repeatedly ject rejected under Delaware law. And I just think that further illustrates why the attempt to, to build in open space or any requirement that's not objective into a deed restriction is unenforceable. And so we would ask, obviously, first on the grounds that were set forth in the Court of Chan Chancery's opinion that this court affirm, 
But as we've discussed, we believe the alternative grounds of the paragraph three application also support affirmance. Unless Thank your honors you. have any questions. No. Thank you. Ms. Thank you very much. In my brief time, I want to make two points. Number one, harmony is an objective standard. It's, it's based on a verifiable fact. Again, please just look at the way the, the analysis of the court in BBD in which it addressed the four different criteria there and how harmony was different. And as far as disputed issues of fact, I simply state, as to, you know, to counsel's pointing out, uh, that we hadn't identified disputed issues of fact. I submit to your honors that the, the, the reasons, the stated reasons for denial in the, in the January letter um, should have been credited in our favor as a factual matter. That's why these cases go to trial. We were deprived of the opportunity to do so. We simply ask for that Thank chance.